Vitamin B12 is a water-soluble micronutrient that exists in several different forms, collectively called cobalamins. And these compounds contain a cobalt atom at the center of a very interesting and complex ring system that can accommodate a variety of different ligands, which are shown in red. And it's these ligands or side chains that determine what form the vitamin B12 is in. A key point to make in this slide is the two active forms are adenosylcobalamin and methylcobalamin. And hydroxycobalamin and cyanocobalamin are precursors to those active forms. So keep that in mind as we go through this lecture. The active forms of B12 serve as coenzymes in reactions that support red blood cell function, DNA synthesis, homocysteine metabolism, energy production, ATP formation, neurological function, muscle health, and cognition. So clearly you can see that there is a, a wide range of clinical applications for vitamin B12, especially if you're trying to address metabolic, neurological, cognitive concerns. You really want to take a look at B12 and make sure that the patient is getting enough of it and that they're absorbing it. So in the stomach, B12 is released from the food matrix. When we consume animal products, which are the only natural source of this vitamin, the, the B12 is bound to proteins. So that complex requires a breakdown by stomach acid and pepsin. And then it's able to bind to transcobalamin 1, which is also called the R protein. And then that carries it into the duodenum where it's released by pancreatic enzymes. And then when B12 is released uh, by the proteases, it then binds to intrinsic factor, which is generated from gastric parietal cells. And that's a protein that uh, needs to be in sufficient amounts to support the proper absorption of this vitamin. The majority of absorption happens in the distal part of the small intestine or the terminal ileum. And when it gets there, the B12 intrinsic factor complex binds to a receptor called cubulin on the surface of the mucosal cells. And that complex is then internalized through endo endocytosis. And once that happens, intrinsic factor is broken down and vitamin B12 is liberated. And then it's bound to another protein called transcobalamin 2. So transcobalamin 2 is responsible for all the subsequent transport and disposition in peripheral tissues. When you give a high dose of vitamin B12, some of it can cross membranes through passive diffusion. So low doses obtained from the diet, you get about a 50% absorption. Whereas higher doses you get from supplements, you're getting one to 3% absorption. But you're still getting a much higher systemic exposure because one or 2% of a high dose is still many fold higher than 50% of the couple of micrograms you might get in a meal. So the advantage here is you're really not relying on uh, so many receptors and proteins. So once B12 is absorbed, it's transported to the liver and most of it is stored there. Some of it is actually secreted back into the gut where it needs to be absorbed again. And that's called enterohepatic recirculation. That's actually a problem in people who don't absorb B12 very well. Not only do they not absorb vitamin B12 effectively, uh, after a meal, but then it gets recirculated back to the gut and they don't absorb that back either. So they're actually losing B12. The remaining fraction that, that doesn't get stored in the liver goes through the bloodstream and then it crosses capillary membranes into tissues, into the interstitial fluid. And then it crosses the cell membrane through another receptor mediated process, endocytosis. So as you can appreciate, the uptake and disposition of this vitamin is very complex and there are a lot of steps that contribute to the wide inter-individual variation uh, in levels and, and uptake of this nutrient. You really want to pay attention to vitamin B12 status in these four patient groups. First, older people really need to pay attention to their dietary intake and you should never assume that you know if they're consuming enough B12 that they're actually absorbing it because stomach acid production declines with age and to some extent, the enzyme secretion declines with age as well. You also want to pay attention to vegetarians and vegans whose dietary intake is usually very, very low because if you're not consuming any animal products, you're really not getting any vitamin B12. The only other way you can get B12 is to consume fermented products because bacteria make 
uh, B12, but this is a very low, uh, low quantity that you could get from those foods. So with vegetarians and vegans, symptoms of B12 deficiency tend to gradually develop over years. Um, so keep that in mind. You might not see any overt symptoms, but uh, you should still take a look at it through some assessment methods, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. You also want to be vigilant of vitamin B12 status in patients with intestinal conditions. So stomach and small intestinal disorders, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, these individuals may not be absorbing enough vitamin B12 to maintain adequate body stores. And again, they, they might excrete more B12 because they're not reabsorbing it once it gets recirculated back to the gut. Uh, metformin and acid blockers. These are two medications that have very good evidence showing that your absorption of vitamin B12 goes down. Uh, so metformin is associated with reduced absorption as uh, would be the case for acid blockers, uh, either histamine receptor blockers or proton pump inhibitors uh, taken over an extended period of time contributes to reductions in vitamin B12. I want to bring your attention to metformin in case you're not aware of this uh, noteworthy drug nutrient uh, depletion. Reduced B12 status has been reported in anywhere between 6 and 30 percent of study subjects. Serum vitamin B12 levels declined by 19 percent after 4.3 years of metformin therapy. So if you're on metformin for four years or more, uh, this is really when you want to suspect uh, lower vitamin B12. And then deficiency risk increased by 7.2%. That was noted in the same study. There was one study conducted a while back where calcium reversed the impairment of vitamin B12 absorption with metformin, but it remains controversial as to whether that's a viable strategy. It might just be easier to administer a higher dose of vitamin B12 in these individuals. Clinical presentation varies widely, but it helps to familiarize yourself with the common symptoms that are shown here. And patients with overt deficiency usually present with macrocytic anemia with a mean corpuscular volume greater than 100 with or without neurological disturbances. So anemia would be if the deficiency is advanced, if it's overt, um, that's easy to detect. Fatigue is usually present as well, um, and that is due in part to a reduction in mitochondrial ATP synthesis. Irritability, apathy, mood changes are also very common. With advanced deficiency, you get inflammation or glossitis of the tongue. And then patients often complain about a burning or prickling sensation, primarily in the extremities, and that's a paresthesia uh, that results from B12 deficits. Neurotube defects and de developmental delays are a more severe consequence pertaining to women of childbearing age. The profound inter-individual variability in vitamin B12 requirements makes a very good case for personalization. So I'm gonna spend the rest of our time together briefly going over the lab assessments, the genetic markers, and supplement considerations. And to really understand B12 personalization, it helps to know the two biochemical mechanisms which are driven by these two distinct active forms. So everything that vitamin B12 does in the body all boils down to these two mechanisms of action that are shown here. So in the cytosol of cells, methylcobalamin supports what we call the methylation pathway, and we'll go into a little bit more detail in the next slide. And the second uh, function of vitamin B12 is in the form of adenosylcobalamin, which operates in the mitochondria as a critical cofactor for an enzyme called methylmalonyl-CoA mutase, or MCM. And that converts methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA in the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle. And that drives the formation of cellular energy in the form of ATP. So when that enzyme doesn't have enough adenosylcobalamin, it slows down and you get a buildup of methylmalonyl-CoA and methylmalonic acid, which you can test for as a marker of intracellular uh, mitochondrial B12 status. For those of you who aren't familiar with the methylation pathway, the whole point uh, of this pathway, for the most part, is to generate SAMe, which is a methyl donor for dozens of other methylation reactions that are not shown here. But a central step in methylation is the conversion of homocysteine to methionine, and that is performed by an enzyme called methionine synthase, 
which requires methylcobalamin as a cofactor. So that is where methylcobalamin comes into play. And methylation plays numerous roles in homeostasis and health, and its functions are very broad, but here I've captured a few of them, um, primarily neurotransmitter synthesis, detoxification, epigenetics, DNA synthesis, and creating cell membrane components uh, like phospholipids. These are just a few of the physiological roles of methylation. Let's take a moment to touch on the four different forms of this vitamin that you'll see available as dietary supplements. Cyanocobalamin is a precursor to both of the active forms. It does release a cyanide group when it's metabolized. So that's one of the reasons why um, many practitioners choose to avoid it. Adenosylcobalamin is one of the active forms that's in the mitochondria. That's, that's the only mitochondrial form. Uh, we touched on it earlier. It, its role is to support energy production, muscle, and nerve health. Methylcobalamin is the second active form. This is mainly involved in homocysteine metabolism and the methylation pathway, and it actually accounts for many of the health benefits of vitamin B12, as does adenosylcobalamin. Hydroxycobalamin, though, when in doubt, um, is a great option because it is a precursor to both adenosyl and methylcobalamin. So that would be appropriate uh, regardless of the exact clinical indication or the, the health goal that you have in mind. The interconversion of different forms of vitamin B12 has been explored uh, in the research, but many open questions still remain. And we're confident that hydroxycobalamin converts to both methylcobalamin and adenosylcobalamin, and that makes it a great choice for general B12 repletion. And we also know that oral methylcobalamin effectively supports the hematological and neuronal markers of B12 status. But I'm going to take the next few minutes to describe adenosylcobalamin in more detail. So in the mitochondria, as I mentioned before, adenosylcobalamin is a cofactor for methylmalonyl-CoA mutase, which plays a key role in the formation of ATP, which is the cellular energy currency. As we get older, the activity of this enzyme declines. And this is recent data showing that enzyme activity in skeletal muscle was lower in old rats compared to middle-aged rats. And this suggests that adenosyl B12 might make more sense for older individuals. Declining mitochondrial function and reduced ATP production are hallmarks of aging that are further magnified by vitamin B12 deficits. And this recent data shows that adenosyl B12 improved mitochondrial ATP formation in B12 deficient myotubes. And myotubes are just muscle fibers at an early stage of development. And in red, you can see a clear increase in ATP levels, while in blue, methylcobalamin had no effect on ATP production. And this was after three days of cells being incubated with each isomer. So adenosyl B12 clearly had an advantage in bioenergetics in muscle cells. In the same study, adenosylcobalamin also improved mitochondrial energy production also known as respiration, and this effect was not evident for methylcobalamin. So again, there seems to be an advantage here for adenosylcobalamin in muscle cells. Of the four different isomers, adenosylcobalamin, shown in red, was by far the most abundant active isomer in skeletal muscle. The, the most abundant precursor was hydroxycobalamin. So key preclinical findings support the functional importance of adenosylcobalamin in healthy aging, bioenergetics, muscle and nerve health. And some key discoveries were that adenosylcobalamin restored mitochondrial function in older animals, stabilized neuromuscular junctions, supported healthy muscle fiber size in older animals, we'll talk about that in a minute, and supported myelination of peripheral neurons. So. The slow twitch muscle fibers uh, that were studied in this experiment are the types of muscle fibers that we rely on every day uh, for walking and other daily activities. And this figure shows that old rats who are given adenosyl cobalamin had a greater proportion of bigger slow twitch muscle fibers than rats who did not receive the supplement. And on the right, you could see that this benefit was not evident for the methylcobalamin. So, 
Adenosyl B12 uh, was also more effective than methylcobalamin in supporting physical performance on what's called the rotorod test. And it's very similar to a, uh, a treadmill test in that you're, you're running on something that's moving and you have to keep running until you're exhausted. But you have to balance yourself on this rotating rod. So animals who are really with it and coordinated and strong and have lots of stamina do really well in this test, whereas uh, older animals who are tired or less coordinated don't do well in this test. And the researchers look at how many times the animal falls off. Um, so in this test, the rats who are supplemented with adenosylcobalamin were better able to keep moving for a longer period of time without losing their balance and falling off of the device. And this performance enhancement was not found for animals who were given an equivalent dose of methylcobalamin. As I mentioned earlier, vitamin B12 plays a critical role in the maintenance of neurons. And uh, one of its roles is to support the maintenance of myelin. And that's the insulation around nerve fibers that allows them to conduct impulses at higher speeds. And in this study, adenosylcobalamin was more effective than methylcobalamin in supporting the formation and the maturation of myelin around peripheral motor neurons that were grown in cell culture. So adenosylcobalamin may be preferable uh, if you are trying to support uh, the myelin sheath around peripheral neurons. So I just went through a lot of preclinical data that shows a unique profile of functions for adenosylcobalamin that are distinct from methylcobalamin. But let's step back and talk about the real distinctions here when you're trying to choose a supplement. So adenosylcobalamin might be preferable if you are addressing the needs of an older individual or you're specifically focused on uh, neuromuscular or neuronal or uh, mitochondrial function uh, having to do with muscle function. Healthy muscle aging is a really good indication for adenosylcobalamin, uh, as well as neuronal myelination, where adenosylcobalamin outperformed the methylcobalamin in the study I just mentioned. Hydroxycobalamin is great as an overall uh, approach for repleting B12 because it's a precursor of both of the active forms. So it will become both adenosylcobalamin and, and methyl B12. Uh, and then methylcobalamin is also good for general B12 repletion. Methylcobalamin might not be the best isomer for mitochondrial, musculoskeletal, or myelination support based on the, the new data, uh, but more clinical trial data are still needed to confirm these functional distinctions in clinical settings. And I just want to reassure you that methylcobalamin is certainly a viable option for general B12 uh, repletion as well as methylation and neuronal support. Keep in mind that this is a very well-studied isomer. There are more than 1,000 studies and scholarly reviews um, that have been published on methylcobalamin, including at least 50 uh, human clinical trials. So this is not an argument to uh, stop using methylcobalamin because it still, still works for many different indications related to B12. So a daily dose between 1,000 and 2,000 micrograms is usually sufficient to replete B12.